Hey, this is Sandy. And Randy. And we're here on AT Corner. Being an athletic trainer comes with ups and downs, and we're here to showcase it all. Join us as we share our world in sports medicine. Welcome back to another episode of AT Corner. For this education episode, we are talking strength and conditioning. How does an athletic trainer differ from a strength and conditioning specialist? How does a strength and conditioning specialist differ from a personal trainer? How can the three of them work together? How can the three of them each have their own separate scope? And with the final goal of impacting athlete healthcare. So we brought on a very good friend of mine, Spencer Ducheni. He has a master's of science in kinesiology from Cal State Fullerton, go Titans a bachelor's in kinesiology from Cal State Fullerton as well. He is a registered strength and conditioning coach through the NSCA. He has his, He's a certified strength and conditioning specialist, and he has his USA Weightlifting Level 1 certification. He's worked at Morningside University as an assistant strength coach, Cal State Fullerton as a te- teaching associate, and as a graduate assistant strength and conditioning coach. He also has experience with the Los Angeles Kings as a strength and conditioning intern, and the Office Sports Academy as the head strength and conditioning coach. Yeah, something I loved about this interview is that you and Spencer, because you guys have spent a long time together, it's really cool to see your relationship really talked about in the podcast. Yes, let's uh, let's hear my guy, Spencer. All right, so of course we got to start with uh, some icebreakers to get us going but we go cryo breakers because we got to be proper around here absolutely so, I like that <laughs> so what made you become a strength and conditioning specialist uh well honestly it really started uh as a athletic training uh desire for myself uh you know when i was in high school we had our uh, school counselor you know goes through your whole college prep situation wants to kind of point in the right direction and say, Hey, like these colleges have something that you might be interested in. I was kind of like, I really don't know exactly what I want to be in. If I could stay in the uh, athletics realm, that would be fantastic. If I could work with athletes, that'd be great. Then I kind of started uh, leaning towards athletic training background. You know, I played a little bit of sports in high school. Uh, I spent my fair share of time in there getting some treatment. And I was like, that sounds like a pretty awesome thing to do. I'd like to also help athletes out. So found out Cal State Fullerton has a very uh, highly regarded kinesiology program that happens to have a very highly regarded athletic training program. Uh, so I went there thinking Spencer's just going to get right into right into athletic training from the get go. Uh, start taking classes. Found out that wasn't as easy as I as it was going to be. Um, actually applied, did not get accepted into the program. So then uh, a family friend of ours who was a physical therapist kind of said, well, you guys have like strength coaches there. Like you should like think about that. And uh, then honestly, I I took a class with uh, Dr. Andy Galpin and I kind of was like, this actually seems more like down my alley. And so then I started taking more of those classes towards, uh, you know, applied exercise science and uh, taking classes that happen to fall in line with uh, Dr. Galpin and some of the other professors. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to go strength and conditioning route. I started my internship uh, in 2015. Um, and then, you know, eventually led to a graduate assistantship. Um, but uh, yeah, it just kind of was something that progressed a little bit from high school, from my experiences from uh, being in athletics, and then kind of evolved from there. Um, and then once I started my internship and started being around athletes and working with them and their training, I was like, this is definitely what I'd like to do. Did you guys have a strength and conditioning coach at your high school when you were an athlete? We did actually. Um, I did. I went to a private high school, so we actually did have a strength coach there. Um, it kind of changed for like three years in a row. We had like a different dude every year. Um, just, I mean, it was one of those things where it was like guy came in and then all of a sudden like brand new school in a different state was like, Hey, we'll offer you more money to come start our school program. Um, but it was still a great atmosphere. You know, when I did freshman football, there was a, um, orientation a uh, week for for uh, strength training and so they actually had some of the coaches that were former players come in and they were uh, showing us like you know hey this is how we want to have you guys squat this is how we this is a clean this is how we do things so you know pvc pipes a lot of technique work um which I actually look back on i was like hey that's you know as much as i disagree with some of the stuff now that we did as uh, athletes then i was like 
that was actually a really well thought out program, you know, that, that they did there with the orientation for all the freshman athletes, no matter what, if it was like football or uh, baseball, mainly the, the main sports, football, baseball, basketball um, yeah. is where they kind of had the coaches be able to interact with that stuff. But um, I still thought, you know, that's a great idea um, when you get into high school athletes. I think nowadays more you, you get a little bit. Um, those freshman athletes are probably a little bit more used to this stuff as like youth athletics and strength and conditioning has become more of a thing than it was then. Yeah. But I think it's still a great tool um, to utilize. So I was very fortunate for that because um, I know not all high schools uh, have that luxury of having strength coaches that are like dedicated to that one thing. So. Yeah. And I feel like that's the unique thing with like strength and conditioning and, you know, athletic trainers in general, we kind of go, we kind of have the same problems as far as the amount of exposure that the lower levels have to these both two professions. Like, cause not every high school has an athletic trainer either. So exactly. it's, it's like one of those things where the struggle seems to be shared a little bit. Absolutely. No, I just, uh, I mean, I've talked with plenty of, uh, you know, public school, athletic trainers over the last couple of years and just, you know, flat out asking like, Hey, do you guys have a strength coach? And it's like, well, the, the, this coach, you know, takes care of that stuff. And then you kind of ask him like, well, like, what do they do? And then you hear some of the stuff you're like, that's a little scary. Um, (laughs) You know, even, even some of the athletes, um, when I worked at a private facility, you know, these athletes are coming in after, after school, obviously. So we have our evening classes and I would talk to some of my kids that are um, in high school after we started a high school program um, for these guys. And it's like they're at these schools and it's like, hey, I know you guys have a weight room there. Or I know you guys have some sort of equipment. And it's like, oh, our coach, you know, had us lift uh, before practice or after practice. And it's like, okay, like, what are you guys doing? And then some of the stories you hear, you know, I had a couple of kids come in and be like, oh, our coach had us. You know, we maxed a deadlift and we maxed squats today. And I'm like, really? <laughs> you know, I wasn't, prepared, I wasn't prepared to hear that answer, um, you know, and it's like, okay, well, like, what did you guys do leading up to this? You know, what, you know, just trying to like pick their brains, like kind of get an idea of like what some of the public school systems um, are like, especially um, I know other, other states place a higher priority on strength and conditioning in the high school realm and especially public schools. And then California does um, it's a little bit different with the laws and how um, school, like school districts can pay for coaches or how they can do stuff. I know that there's coaches in orange County um, and other counties in California that are strength coaches, you know, but I think it's primarily um, they're like a PE teacher or a, they're a teacher on staff. You get your, you know, you get your pay there. And then you kind of do the strength conditioning on the side when you have time. Um, and I know some coaches have built some phenomenal programs. Um, in terms of being able to teach and then do the strength and conditioning afterwards. But yeah, it's just some of the horror stories be like, Oh, we were like, we'll, we were single arm pressing while, you know, laying down sideways in a plank. And then I'm like, okay. I'm like, I'm trying to envision what this looks like. Or <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, I've never used that with an athlete before. I've never seen a coach um, or a mentor of mine use do that before, but you know, someone saw it somewhere or, you know, came up with this idea in their dreams and was like, let's implement it with these kids that have never done anything. So um, <laughs> it's definitely, it's definitely a struggle, but yeah, I was very blessed to have a coach there for as many things as I didn't agree with looking back now um, or be like, oh, maybe I would have done, I would do things different personally. It's like, I still had someone there who knew what they were talking about. Absolutely. Awesome. So another question to get to know you a, be- a little bit better what is your strength and conditioning spirit animal? And for our new listeners, this is equipment, a tool, a brace, something in the strength and conditioning realm that represents you as a strength and conditioning specialist. That's that, you know, that's been a tough one. I've been, I've been thinking about this all week long. Um, and I've kind of, I've had multiple things, uh, that kind of pop into my head about this. Um, because a lot of different memories come up, um, for myself, you know, I've, I've been injured a handful of times. Um, I've tweaked this and tweaked that I've sprained, um, my knee a couple of times, you know, I played football a little bit freshman year. Um, so I definitely had some things come up. I would say though, um, I've kind of always like self-identified myself, um, 
I'm, I, you know, I fell in love with uh, the deadlift. So I'd have to say, like, I always just picture, you know, myself on a platform with like a loaded barbell, uh, ready to pull, ready to just yank out some deadlifts. Um, so I would say a nice, a nice loaded uh, barbell sitting on a platform would be like if I could use a profile picture for myself as a coach. <laughs> uh, I'd rather not use like my uh, my knee braces for my MCL sprains uh, and my knee dislocations. So I'm like I'm gonna choose I'm gonna choose the loaded barbell on a platform as my that'd be like my spirit animal. Or if I could choose a profile picture as a coach, I love it. I don't I don't know too many people that would voluntarily say like Oh, I want to bang out some deadlifts. <laughs> Hell yeah. Yeah. Hey, dead, uh, dead December is coming up here in a couple of weeks. Okay. So we got, we got to get ready for that. Oh God. I love it. Yeah. I feel like deadlifts are like, you love them or you hate them. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, I mean, you, hell, I can see the look on some, some of my athletes, uh, former athletes faces whenever, you know, we program some sort of deadlift and some people are like, is that with the barbell or like with the hex bar? You know, some people, when they find out it's with the hex bar, they'd be relieved. And some people that find out it's with the barbell, they'd be like, I don't want to do these. (laughs) Guess what? We are. (laughs) We're doing them. Right. So the unique thing about our podcast is we do like to mix some education with some story. So do you have a story, maybe an experience or case study about how you've collaborated with the AT staff in the care of an athlete? This could be funny, serious, a life hack, anything. Yes. Um, Another one I've been thinking about because there's definitely a couple of things that come, come to mind. Um, you know, having the pleasure of working with you, Randy, um, before and swapping, uh, you know, what he said, she said stories about how bad an injury was over, over a couple of years, um, has always been interesting to, to see the two sides of things, how severe an injury is in the weight room and then how, uh, non-severe it is when it gets to the athletic training room or vice versa. Um, but I'd have to say one really stands out because it's the only time I've ever seen it happen in person. Um, and I get, you know, probably happens more than I'd like to, more than I think, and more than I probably like to think about it. Um, but I did have a former athlete who did not, I don't believe he really disclosed, um, any prior, uh, problems with his shoulder to anybody, uh, let alone myself, um, or that it was an issue, but, um, we were, we were getting ready one day, we're doing our warm ups. everyone gets to their uh, stations, we're going through um, clean our clean uh, preparation and stuff. So we're going through um, our mobility drills, um, we've got our bar prep, and then uh, through our warm up sets, uh, we're going through, everyone's looking phenomenal, you know, we're, we're having a great day, we're getting ready for stuff. I was like, this is a good time of year. I think it was, uh, I believe it was more like a recovery phase. So um, or at least for some, uh, I think it was like, you know, that mix between, uh, for indoor season, out, getting ready for outdoor. So for some, it was recovery day for indoor. Um, the gentlemen, however, were doing, um, a little bit more of an intense program. And I had a guy, you know, go for a clean pull and, uh, actually dislocate his shoulder. Um, which I got to see right there. I happened, I just so happened to be right at his rack, you know, watching him go when he did this. Uh, I've heard, I heard probably one of the loudest yelps I've ever heard from a person. Um, and it really just kind of caught me off guard because I was like, that really just happened in front of me. And so I happened to, um, we happened to have an athletic trainer that was on a full-time guy that was on staff, um, that had been there for a while, happened to just be walking by the weight room as that happened. Um, we got his attention. He, we immediately knew like what was going on based off how he was walking, the fact that he couldn't move his arm and everything. It was like holding it. And we're like, everyone's just like draw drop to the floor. Um, and he goes, don't worry. He's like, I've done this before. He's like, I know he's like, we, he's like, we'll take care of you. He's like comforting him. And you know, the athlete went from like kind of yelping and, you know, being loud to like that soothing uh, tone, you know, of the, of the athletic trainer was like, it kind of helped like calm me down a little bit too, because I was like, Holy crap. I just saw this thing. thing. I'm like, I'm like, you know, you hear, you hear about stuff. You, you, you read about things. You're like, Hey, like, what do you do in emergency situations with injuries and this and that? Um, but you know, some of those things, it just kind of goes out the window until it happens in front of you or until you see it, you know, it doesn't always like click right away. Um, and so that was one of those things where I was like, okay, like we definitely, I definitely can't do anything for him. 
Um, that's not within my scope of expertise. Um, but thankfully he was there and, you know, he was able to take him, got him, you know, reset and everything. Um, got him set up with some, uh, with some treatment was kind of helping him out with the pain and everything. Um, guy comes back 45 minutes later towards the end of the training session when everyone's kind of, you know, foam rolling, doing their thing, cool down, uh, chit chat before they head out of the weight room. And he was, he's like, yeah, I'll be fine. He's like, I've done this a lot. And I was just like, that's not really what I want to hear. <laughs> I was like, I don't want to hear that this is like, you know, the seventh time you've done this or something. So I'm like, now we kind of got to rethink some things going forward, not only because of the injury we just had, but, you know, also from the standpoint of this is something that you've encountered quite a bit. So I'm like, there's clearly an issue somewhere. Um, so yeah, that was probably, that's probably the story that honestly stick with me. One of the ones that'll stick with me the most is because I was, I mean, I even, I know myself, I just got caught so off guard by that thing. Oh, big time. Yeah. Especially like you said, you, you know, you're not thinking about it and you're having a great session and then that happens. Absolutely. Were you able to work with the athletic trainer on like what to avoid in the future or what? Or did um, you yeah, we talked on? about some stuff. Okay. We, we, um, we kind of went over because, you know, obviously after that, kind of the deeper history for things kind of came out about like, oh, I've done, like, you know, I've had this happen a couple of times, like from other stuff. I think he played football as well in high school. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was kind of an issue as well. Um, so we just kind of modified that plan going forward for the rest of the year. Um, it actually happened to be my last year. So, you know, I only had, I was only really in charge, um, of their stuff for about the next four months or so, uh, before summertime. And then obviously like post, um, nationals and stuff for, for track. But, um, yeah, yeah, we just kind of modified stuff. I was like, Hey, we can still like get X, Y, and Z out of this, but he needs to really kind of take care of some of this stuff. So we did a lot of, um, like, single arm strengthening um for that one side because you know after that we kind of looked at things like okay like definitely a lot weaker on that one side even beforehand but now you add this into there and it kind of exasperates that a little bit more it's like a little bit more of an issue than it was before so um, we just kind of worked some things he went and got treatment i think for the next couple of weeks with that trainer um and then just um kind of we went forward he he helped he healed up really well um, and he was able to still do a lot of the things that we wanted to get out of them in training. So it ended up, you know, being a positive experience in the end. Absolutely. It's all about uh, modifying what you can to still kind of get some of the same results. So oh, absolutely. Yeah. So now it's uh, now it's time for the meat and potatoes. All so right. I know I know a lot of people. And it probably differs by state too. Don't know exactly what a strength and conditioning specialist can do. So what, what is the scope of a strength and conditioning specialist? Uh, well, if, uh, if I'm going to get scientific here or if I'm going to get real official here, I can take it straight from the NSCA, um, <laughs> like kind of, uh, guidelines, um, you know, article about stuff. Um, you know, there's the two sides, um, to everything. There's, uh, the scientific side, and then there's also the practical and appliance applied side. Um, or as, um, you know, uh, someone who I had a lot of classes with, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin had said in a lot of his classes is uh, strength and conditioning is a is science and it's art. And that's the, the art is the practical applied uh, side of things. And he's like, you know, uh, everything we do is backed by science. Um, so there, there's a rhyme and a reason for this stuff, but he's like, you also need to be able to be creative with it. You need to be able to, um, not just like cookie cutter everything and kind of come out with it. Um, I know that, um, I think a common misconception, what I hear a lot is when I tell people, you know, what my background is in or what I, what I do or what I want to do. Um, they're like, Oh, so like, you just want to, like, you just want to be a personal trainer. And it's like, uh, well, if you want to go that route. Yeah, if, if that's how if that's how it fits in your head and everything, it's like that's fine. Um, I, that's not how it works in mine. Um, you know, I I envision, or I think when people say personal trainer, they immediately envision you know working at a twenty four hour fitness or um, another uh, corporate corporate gym or of some sort or any place where you know anybody's mom can come in and be like, let's go do some dumbbell workouts, let's do some TRX, let's do you know Zumba or something. And I'm never going to bash 
any of that stuff ever because you know everyone does something for their own their own well being. Um, but what I like to try and distinguish is that you know my purpose working with an athletic population is to try and improve athletic performance um, and availability. Uh, and preparedness for athletic competition for people with these goals. You know, I'm working with uh, athletes with a specific goal in mind, and that's athletic, uh, athletically minded or athletic minded. Uh, and we, you know, we have this goal to try and be great on the field by working on things off the field for us. So, you know, I'm in charge of preparing these programs, you know, weeks, months in advance having this long-term goal for ourselves and then still day-to-day taking it as it comes and kind of altering things. Um, And our end goal is really athletic performance and excellence. And that's, um, you know, whether it be working with like a youth population for myself, you know, I had a lot of kids like, Hey, I want to make a high school baseball team. I want to make the high school football team and I want to be a starter. Okay, great. This is, this is a definite more involved, more intense process than someone coming in and be like, I'd like to fit into my wedding dress better, you know, <laughs> it's like, um, which, you know, at, a, at the private facility I was at, um, we had a guy that was doing personal training there and that's what some of the people were like. They just wanted to come in and they wanted to just come, you know, have somebody take the reins for a half an hour and just tell them, okay, like do these things because you know, they don't know better. Um, they don't know what they want to do or what they need to do. So on a basic level, have like a personal trainer do that. Um, and then for my youth athletes, it was, okay, like this is, these are things that we need to teach. Like we need to teach you guys how to move properly. I need to teach you more in depth processes. Um, and so that's kind of, that's kind of more like my scope. Um, you know, I'm working using science that has been published and everything to try and curb what I'm doing and how I'm doing with my athletes, you know, that's going to help dictate, um, you know, how much or how little of things that I'm doing with them. Uh, what time of year I'm going to do it with them, and then how, again, you know, teaching them these tools um, so that our training becomes more um, more part of their life and they understand more of the things that we're doing. Oh, definitely. And I think that's what people don't really think about between the difference of like a strength and conditioning specialist and a personal trainer is also the amount of education that goes behind strength and conditioning. You're getting someone who at least has a four-year degree Whereas someone who's a personal trainer, what, they could probably take a course in a couple months and then get their certification that way. Absolutely. Yeah, I know that's um, usually, I mean, especially nowadays, it's very competitive market, which I'm, I've found out firsthand, continuing to find out firsthand uh, how competitive things are out there. But, um, you know, even with, you know, multiple years of experience, multiple different um, locations in terms of not just, uh, you know, physical, like geographically, But also, you know, working with a youth population, um, working and getting experience with professional athletes, getting experience with college athletes at uh, Division One and NAI levels. You know, it's there's there's definitely a big there's a big difference between a lot of these things, you know, not just obviously you see the difference between physically uh, professional athletes and college athletes, but different sports across uh, different uh, levels of competition in college, there's a wide gap between um, some stuff between not just physical attributes, but also uh, some of the physical capabilities when it comes to the weight room activities. Um, you know, obviously schools recruit differently, um, different styles. Uh, some schools are, you know, known as getting the big, uh, you know, corn fed kids out of <laughs> the Midwest or on the West mm-hmm. Coast. And then some schools obviously play different styles. So they recruit a little bit differently. But it's definitely um, wide range um, for that stuff and really just trying to kind of work within those populations. And it is a lot more in depth and you do need a lot more education. Like you said, Um, you know, you you, you need to know what you're talking about and it's not going to come from a three month course online. So. Yeah, absolutely. So you kind of talked about this in your story experience that we started off with, but um, what can a strength and conditioning specialist do that an athletic trainer can't do? So like what's in your scope that maybe what a lot of our listeners are athletic trainers. So mm-hmm. how can we better utilize you based on what you guys can do that we can't? Okay. Um, well, first off, I'd like to definitely say um, that there are a lot of highly qualified athletic trainers that happen to also be strength coaches out there. 
And that is something that I definitely understand. Um, just from personal experiences, I'd also say, and just uh, also conversations, um, other coaches, when you go to the national conference, I've had, um, the opportunity and to speak with a lot of different people, you know, whether it's just like a casual conversation, um, you find yourself in the significant group meeting of the same sport or something like that. And you hear different stories from other people, um, which there's millions a month upon millions of stories everyone has, um, I would say the biggest thing that I've encountered and I've also heard is, you know, um, is athletic trainers who don't have a strength and conditioning background. Um, obviously there's the same education in terms of like anatomy and physiology that we all go through that we have to pass, but more so like the, the day-to-day idiosyncrasies of working with athletes when it comes to teaching form and teaching how, how we're going to process and how we need to feel and how we need to like, actually work through exercise and what our techniques going to be on this stuff and how we should be feeling when we progress through, uh, the more detailed, uh, portions of this, you know, when we, Hey, when we increase by 5%, now this is what we should be feeling. And this is how things are going to feel once we start working within these different intensity and rep ranges with everything. And it's kind of one of those things, like, unless you put yourself through that stuff and you've been around that, you really don't, I kind of understand like the full you know, scope of all that stuff. And you don't really feel like, Hey, this is what a 95% squat feels on my back. This is what 90% feels like and so on and so forth. And so I think when some people, uh, to quote, uh, you know, LeVar Ball from many, many years ago, you know, like they said, to stay in your lane. Um, when people start getting into stuff that they haven't, they don't have experience in, then it kind of starts muddying the waters a little bit. And it's like for the people who are certified. And I think that's a clear distinction and clear, Um, part is like, you know, if you have the proper certifications, you know, you've had to go through the education, you've had to take, um, you know, a quiz or a test on this stuff, you've had to listen and go through videos. And um, for strength coaches, you know, USA weightlifting um, certification is part um, education online or in person. And then, um, or, you know, you in person part, but then there's also a practical applied part. So like you actually work through the stuff that you're trying to learn and the different progressions, regressions for things, how things should be feeling, you know, Hey, when I, when I do, you know, a clean progression, crap, this is what this feels like. So it's like, when I teach my athletes, it's like, Hey, like, I understand you're probably going to feel discomfort here to start off, but I understand that it will get better because you know, you've done that stuff and just trying to understand those things. So I think that's kind of like the main thing is if you're not certified for it, um, or you, you know, you haven't done it, um, you know, you try, I would say people, you know, try to stay out of, you know, offering advice and things you don't know. Like I'm not going to go give somebody financial advice on, uh, hot stock tips or, uh, crypto trading right now. So I don't have a finance degree. I'm not, you know, I don't read up on the stuff as much as a lot of other people who have that background do. So I'm not going to go tell somebody that they're wrong in that. Um, so I think that's, that's really the main distinction is, you know, without that, like without the certifications, without the education, the background, and the experience in it is programming some of these things like, you know, squats and uh, deadlifts and cleans and snatches and stuff like things that aren't really well known and kind of out of the realm is like really kind of like trying to program those things. So that's where I say like, that's kind of like the muddy in the waters of like staying out of that part. Oh, definitely. And I feel like, like ATs always complain about that from other Staying in their lane. Yes, about other professionals doing that. So definitely a mutual respect, you know, that, you know, we should also recognize, like, that is definitely not our lane. Mm -hmm. Because I think one area that, you know, strength and conditioning specialists are very valuable is in your later stages of rehab, when you need someone to actually take them through higher levels of loading than what we can do in the clinic. Mm -hmm. I think that often gets forgotten about. And that's where strength conditioning specialists really crush it. Yeah, I'd like to, you know, I've seen uh, plenty of people come back from rehab and people uh, come back from, you know, bumps and bruises, um, especially um, at the collegiate, in the collegiate setting, you know, you see a lot of, a lot of injuries arise, you know, there's a lot of different reasons for it. One, you know, you you got very physical people, you're doing much higher intensity, uh, much more complex usually um, in their strength training program. But also they have a much higher load, you know, on top of everything, they've got school, uh, they've got life, they're, you know, 18 to 22 year old kids, 
or adults. Uh, so there's a lot of things in life that are happening on top of a strength program and education and their sport. So um, you see these people come back and it's like, yeah, at some point, like a band does not do anything for them. You know, at some point they need more than a five pound resistant band to aid them in recovery. And that's definitely been a hot uh, topic with other athletic trainers um, at multiple stops or people in the ath- in the rehab slash physical therapy realm in conversations I've had is, you know, oh, they're feeling discomfort here. They're probably out for a week or they should come and just like ride the bike for five minutes. And it's like, no, it's like, how about we yeah. just modify what they're doing to maybe take out a certain loading phase or a certain portion of their, um, of their stuff. You know, I've had athletes, um, working in, um, football and, um, having that experience of, um, you know, guys making a deep run, especially during COVID, you know, like, uh, the athletic season got kind of really screwed up for a lot of States where athletes that were in States where they got to play then had a big break while other schools got to play. And then they had to come back later for like playoffs. And it was like, it turned into like a 10 month season. That's normally seven months or eight months, you know? So just very drawn out. So it's like, you saw a lot of injuries arise from there. You saw little bumps and bruises, little things, because it's hard. You can't sustain excellence athletically like that at going at a hard pace for 10 months, like straight nonstop. It's just stuff's going to come up, you know, um, wear and tear is going to happen. But you know, guys with like back issues and it's like, well, they can't squat, they can't load, they can't press. And it's like, okay, well, how about we just load their hips like on a pit shark or, um, you know, there's um, like the pendulum squat and other um, modalities that you can use um, to try and load an athlete still in the lower body without really affecting or harming their back or their upper body injury that they have. And they're like, well, I don't know about that. And then it's like, okay, well, so-and-so go get on there and let's see how you feel. Load it up with 300 pounds or whatever eventually. Um, you know, start small and load it up. It's like, Hey, let's see how you do. You usually squat 400. Let's put 250 on there, whatever. And they're like, Holy crap, this feels amazing. This is like, my back doesn't hurt. My legs feel great. You know, they still get that lower body training session in, and they're not taking a week off and then expected to go out and play once their back, you know, calms down or like once that stuff, it's like, I think that's a big misunderstood, uh, concept is that, movement is medicine in that terms. A lot of people are, you know, saying this right now and coming out with things. Um, so by, by no stretch of the imagination, is this like some prophecy that I'm delivering here today? Um, but, uh, you know, I think the old, the old, uh, saying of go of, of like rice, you know, go ice everything, go rest it, go ice it and everything, just stay off of it is gone far out the window in most cultures or most settings. And movement has become a better form of medicine to promote healing. And so, you know, by keeping those athletes moving, it's been, it's generally worked out a lot better for, for in the cases that I've seen. Hey, that's been ACSM's big push lately is movement is medicine. Absolutely. I think, um, a big, uh, some guy that I actually found out a long time ago, he's gotten a lot bigger, um, you know, since I first saw him and, um, even I saw him like way before he, uh, published his first book or published, I don't know his first book, but at least the book that I saw, his book was squat university, but, um, Dr. Aaron Horshig, um, mm-hmm. is a big proponent for, uh, one, the squat, because, uh, he wrote a whole book, um, on teaching and, you know, fixing the squat and mobility. Uh, but that's always been a big thing from him is, you know, movement is mobility. It's like, you have issues with this, you got pain here. It's like, well, adjust, you know, this and that and move, just keep moving and keep working through it. And, um, adjust things as they come by. And that's, um, I think that's, I think that's probably one of the mis- most misunderstood or forgotten concepts is when there's pain or discomfort, people like to just shut things down and let that go. And it's like, okay, well, let's find out why you have pain and discomfort. Absolutely. Yeah. I like to promote active rest where it's, okay, let's rest from the thing that's triggering and what may be causing this overuse or or what's irritating the issue, but right. we're still being active in other things and making sure we're, we're keeping up our cardio and all that. Absolutely. No, I think that's, that's always like been a key thing. And it's, um, it's definitely something I have to keep reminding myself because I think you're for everyone's first instinct is to like, Holy crap, it hurts. Don't do it anymore because you don't want to make it worse. And then it's like, okay, let's take a step back, readjust, readjust things. How can we 
work around whatever issue arises. Like you said, like the overuse, um, you know, or what's irritating a thing. Like let's how can we, you know, work around that issue. Also as ATs, you know, you're going to lose a lot of respect with, especially an athletic population. If you just tell them, oh, well, we're shutting it down, you know, so to actually go through and, you know, pick the brain of a strength and conditioning specialist, or if you kind of have an idea of what can be modified, uh, working within those parameters, you're going to get a lot of respect from your athletic population. Cause at least they don't have to think like, well, well, every time I go to you, you just take me out. Like, no, exactly. there's, there's, there's a rhyme or a reason to what can be done. No, exactly. And that's one thing that I actually really appreciate working with you, Randy, over the years uh, was always that, you know, we had pretty open communication about people's injuries and like what we could, could not do or what we might want to stay away from um, for certain people um, just based off, you know, what they what they say when they come to you versus what they say when they come to me. Um, And just kind of having like that open line of communication really helped a lot uh, because, then I I feel like the athletes, you guys, you made it a very comfortable setting for them to come to you with anything versus like, like he said, you know, holy crap, every time I go to Randy, he's gonna, he's not, he's gonna tell me I can't run. And they're like, I have to run this weekend. Like, you know, I have to post a time to be able to qualify. And they're like, I'm not going to put that in jeopardy. So I'm just not going to go. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say now we're going on the the flip side of it. What can ATs do that strength and conditioning specialists can't do? A lot. <laughs> 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 um, I'm. I mean, I'm smart enough to know. You know, again, stay in my own lane with stuff. Um, as much as I as much as I know about you know injuries or things that arise from training. And like what different injuries mean, you know, a sign of a, a, a certain injury having been injured a pl- plenty of times myself, uh, you know, and then we also we, we obviously take classes together where it's like, hey, this is an injury prevention class or this is a diagnosis of certain injuries. I'm like, OK, well, I do know like I know how to perform. Uh, was it the Lockman test mm-hmm. for ACLs? It's like, yeah, I understand how to do that but I'm also not certified to, you know, <laughs> perform that and then be like, yep, here's the diagnosis. Like everyone's got to roll with it because I said it, um, you know, it's like, uh, I think there's a rule in, um, in the healthcare system where um, I think like, you know, 911, like you get an ambulance goes out to an emergency and stuff. I don't think I could be wrong about this, but I was always under the impression that like paramedics, or maybe it has to be paramedics and doctors only can pronounce somebody officially deceased. Um, you know, like they have like certain people can't just be like, Oh, this person's dead. Um, you know, they have to like be certified or have to have like a medical degree to be able to be like, yes, the official time of death for somebody of like this, you know, is whatever time it is. And so it's like, you know, people stay in their own lanes because they're certified to one measure signs of life and understand what could, could not be happening. Maybe if this person's still alive, like a weak pulse or whatnot. So, you know, I know that like I can't diagnose sickness, injury, and give my medical advice on this stuff. Um, you know, I could perform a Lockman test and be like, "Yeah, I think you tore your ACL." Um, you know, what is it? The, there's another one, it's like the posterior drawer test or something. I think is another one. Um, but you know, I can be like, "Oh yeah, you probably sprained your MCL," or uh, you know, if something went bad, it's like, "Well, you probably have rotator cuff injury," or you know, all these, these little uh, injuries and stuff. It's like, I can give my two cents to an athlete and be like, okay, you're sore from training, you know, or we're a little tight from whatever it was that we're doing, you know, your sport, you know, you had a busy weekend out on the track, you're going to feel X, Y, and Z. But when it comes to like, Hey, I got injured over the weekend with like a hamstring injury or a knee injury. It's like, okay, I'm not the one talking with, you know, the team doctors about x-rays and scheduling that stuff. I'm not, I mean, I have no idea where to even begin with that stuff, but um, it's, it's just something like, you know, Hey, I like, I can't diagnose you. I can't give you treatment. I can give you a prescription of exercise within the guidelines that is set by you guys. You know, you guys are the ones medically giving them, treatment every day and kind of measuring progress within this stuff. So it's like, you guys are certified to do so. I'm not anywhere near certified to, you know, I could tape an ankle. I mean, I could tape a mean ankle right now, but uh, (laughs) I'm not certified to like, Hey, I've got knee pain. Okay. Well, let's see like what's going on and uh, let's give you treatment. Let's go through this. Let's give you some stem. Let's um, you know, what compression um, you know, whatever we need to do. 
um, I'm not there. So yeah. a lot of that stuff I can't do. Um, but then also, um, when it comes to like, more, I mean, staying on that medical side, like coming back from injury, you know, protocols to test athletes, like for concussions, uh, you know, how prepared are you coming off of a broken bone or a fracture? Um, or even like a tear, you know, if we, if it's something you can even work around, it's like, I don't, I like, I like, I can see like, oh, they squat really well, but it's like all the smaller things to test and prepare athletes for coming back is something a little bit out of my scope. Um, yeah. you know, there's certain things that I can do and certain things that I understand. And I know just from reading and being in, in the atmosphere and stuff, like I understand when someone's not moving well because they're feeling hurt or they're, they've got some sort of limitation going on. I can pick up on that stuff. What I am not going to do is try to be like, well, let's just have you flip over and foam roll the crap out of your hamstring. And then let's take the Theragun and then let's ice you up and just have you like, you know, do this, this and that. So that's the stuff that I stay away from because yeah. I'm completely out of my realm. And when it comes to the diagnosis and treatment of stuff, and I just defer to you guys. I'll let you guys be the bad guys with athletes, by the way. I'll one hundred percent I would hundred percent let you be the bad guy and deliver the bad news to them. Be like, well, let's just say you can't perform this weekend. Uh and I'll be like, Man, that's tough, dude. I can't believe they tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That is definitely within the job description. So I yeah. we can we can shoulder that. <laughs> Absolutely. I hope so. <laughs> so Athletic trainers don't always work at places that have strength and conditioning specialists. I know that I've never worked at a, I don't think I've ever worked at a place that's had one, but Randy's worked at a a couple. And so this next um, topic, I just want to go over how can athletic trainers and strength conditioning specialists work together and mostly like for either strength and conditioning specialists or athletic trainers who have not really worked with people with each other before, how would you suggest to create that relationship um i would say i think the biggest thing always is um have a constant and open line of communication um especially if you're just getting to know somebody um i know that for myself when i first started um in the college system being actually in charge of athletes i knew some athletic trainers like i knew um i knew people when i started you know i got to know randy Um, but then like other, you know, grad assistant people and other full-time people, it's, it's, it's a little daunting to kind of like start a relationship with those people. And I understand that. Um, I like to think that I'm pretty social when it comes to introducing myself and talking to folks. Um, but, um, I think really just having that constant line of communication, like I'd rather be overly communicative, uh, communicative with my athletic trainer. And I'd rather them do the same with me. I'd rather them like send me too much stuff at first and then kind of go from there rather than be really surprised when people don't show up or people come and tell me in the middle of a training session, so-and-so said, I can't do this. And I'm like, well, why? And they're like, I don't know. They just said that. I mean, you know, they just told me this. And it's like, okay, well, you obviously had to go for that to them for some reason. And they've obviously X'd this out, but it's like, I'd rather find out beforehand rather than, you know, in a room with 40 athletes and have two of them tell me that two different things they can't do. And now I'm, you know, watching 38 other people while trying to, you know, on the fly do this. That's obviously going to happen. That's part of the job. I understand that. I, you know, I've become accustomed to on the fly adjusting stuff and, and, you know, just pulling things out of my pockets to try and um, alter things for athletes. But the most you can um, you know, try and eliminate that as possible would be, is key. Um, and then likewise for a strength coach, um, I think it's important for strength coaches to reach out to those athletic trainers rather than it just being that one way street of an athletic trainer reaching out to the coach. And, you know, if a coach sees something like, Hey, um, so-and-so, you know, felt some discomfort here. I told them that they need to come see you. Um, this is like what I saw X, Y, and Z. And then I could try and give you guys some information to work off with athletes, just like, you know, strength coaches would like information, but like, okay, well, like how bad is, you know, the sprain or how bad is like the discomfort when he was with you? Like, how bad was it after treatment? Like, what can we do? How much can we get away with um, type of deal? So that way, when an athlete comes and says something too, it's like, oh, my pain's at an eight. And it's like, really? Because you just said it was a four when you were with Randy. So it's like, (laughs) pick, 
pick up, you know, pick a number and stick with it between one and 10 here. Um, but I think that, that uh, constant communication is very key. Um, I think when trainers are working in a setting where they don't have a strength coach on staff, um, I think that like getting, asking for help on both ends is key, but you know, really trying to, um, understand that you guys are both there for the care of this athlete. And so you're on, you're on the same team. You, you do different things, but you're, you're ultimately on the same team and your goal is to care for and watch after these athletes and you're doing stuff what's in the best interest for them. So I've heard stories of people bickering and arguing back and forth. Um, and I understand it's going to happen. It's just human nature, but I think understanding that you guys both have two different roles um, and there's no shame in asking each other for help or advice on either of these roles. You know, um, I was, I actually had a, uh, at one of my stops, we had, um, athletic trainers that weren't necessarily full time. They were like, they worked at the school, but they worked, they were employed through like a clinic. So they had mm-hmm. like separate stuff. I mean, they, they were there, but they weren't always there when I was there. Um, you know, whether I'm there early in the morning or, um, and whatnot, or I'm there late at night and they've gone home or they've gone to the clinic or something like that, whatever their job description was. Um, and so it's like, well, okay, you guys have injuries, you guys get diagnosed, well, or you guys have to go in tomorrow. And it's like, I would try to let them know, Hey, so-and-so felt this. I had one athletic trainer that would really give me, um, detailed information about, um, injuries for per athlete and like who was, who was cleared, who wasn't. Um, you know, especially working with like a volleyball population, a lot of jumping, it's like, Hey, let's stay away from jumping for X, Y, and Z athlete. Let's alter this and that. And I was like, that's fantastic. I don't see this person often. Um, you know, they're not always on campus when I'm there. Um, also we're not super close, but we're not super far either. Um, but being able to have that communication via email was super easy and it was very helpful for us. Um, so I just think it's, you know, it's very key to to kind of get to know that person outside of the sport realm as well. Um, you know, I don't know, I, I, I didn't really hang out with my athletic trainers uh, at my last stop, but it was, you know, I knew them outside. I still had conversations with them in passing, and I was very cordial and tried to be as personable as possible um, with them because it just created a better working relationship with them. I really love what you said about asking for help, and I think that really helps with that open line of communication. No, absolutely. That was, um, I mean, I deferred a lot to Randy. Um, I deferred a lot to other athletic trainers be like, do you think, you know, especially as a, as a new strength coach, I'm like, do you think that I could do this maybe with them? And you don't know, offer up something and be like, or um, be like, Hey, can I change their grip? And, or can I, can I give them a neutral uh, grip attachment for this press or this pull? And it's like, it should put less pressure here. X one, you know, you know, insert wherever you want after that, or, Hey, can I have them do partial range of motion? Can I have them do, you know, lighter weight at, can I have them do something that's not discomforting for them? And it's like, I'm just trying to find a solution to this problem here. And it's like, I'll, I'll talk to you as much as I can or as little as I need to. And uh, we'll just kind of, um, we'll kind of go from there, you know, work, work with these athletes on this stuff. You know, I think the biggest thing is um, most of my athletes I had, there's definitely outliers, but most of them were like, I don't want to miss all this stuff. Like I still want to do something. So maybe they wouldn't be as honest with me about it because they didn't want to miss training, but it's like, let's, you know, let's, let's, let's work on altering this stuff. So you don't miss more training. And that's by keeping that open line of communication, asking help from you guys to, you know, relay what they say to us. Cause every, I'm mean, sure there's things that they say to me that they probably don't tell you and vice versa when it comes to how things are going. Um, and I know that for a fact, like you guys see athletes on a daily basis, whereas, you know, I'm seeing them maybe two, three times a week and I'm not really interacting with them in the same way that you guys are, like you guys much more relaxed environment until the training room gets completely full. Um, but you know, you guys are sitting there having a conversation with them. You're seeing an athlete for maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, or you're coming back to them multiple times for treatment, you know? I'm walking by and I'm, I'm evaluating my athlete based on how they're moving and I'm seeing things like, Hey, if I need to change things, great. If I don't awesome, you guys are looking great. Let's keep it going off to the next group, off to the next like pod or the next rack of, of athletes, you know, especially with, um, with like track being such a big population, you've got way more historically, you've got way more athletes in there. And so 
I don't have like a, you know, I don't have a jumpers st- or uh, jumpers are big, but uh, I don't have like a, um, like pole vault. Pole vault's not usually a huge portion of the track team um, where, you know, you maybe have like five to eight people there. And it's like, I can see them all right in front of me. Whereas I get a cross country team or a, a sprinters group, you know, you start getting like 35, 40, 45 kids in these groups. And it's like, okay, I can have everybody in front of me, you know, technically, but I can't like split both eyes goes both ways. And I can't see all the way down the hall, everybody at once and see like all the minute stuff. I can see general things. Um, you know, if I see somebody struggling, obviously I'm going to go address that. But once I go to address that, I can't see what's happening. Like at my five or six o'clock, you know, when I'm addressing that with that person. So, um, obviously I'm going to miss things, um, that might get caught when he, when it comes to you guys. So, um, I think that asking for help all the time, there's no shame in that at all. And I would say that goes the same for the AT side of things. You know, I will always say some of the coolest and smartest people to talk to as an athletic trainer are strength and conditioning coaches, because like you said, (laughs) they have the science part, but they also have the practical aspect and they understand what needs to be done and how they can do it, how you can get creative. Cause I know for me, like asking for help as far as like, I know I, at a certain point I can't load an athlete appropriately for what they need. And I need, I need you guys to do that. Or also like, yes, I know like maybe some adjustments to certain exercises, but no way am I going to say that's my area of expertise. You guys know different exercises that like, okay, deadlift's not working. How can we modify it? All I know is, hey, they just can't deadlift. So man, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> and I like to, that's why I like to defer to you guys. Like, hey, they, I know they can't do this, this, and this. Like whatever you can to work around that, I think will be perfect. And then, mm-hmm. yeah, like even when you, like like you said, like asking about gri- different grips and stuff, like that helps me because then I'm like, oh yeah, like, that probably will be fine. Like, I, I think that's worth a shot. So it's definitely a learning experience from the AT side of things as well, because, you know, we, yes, we have, like, we take intro to strength and conditioning, but that doesn't mean like, oh, like I know how to program. No, not at mm-hmm. all. So like understanding what you guys are doing and how you guys are programming, it's a big learning experience for us. Yeah, absolutely. I'd say, and like, I would say probably also like-minded too. Like, I mean, I've been in the training room a little bit, um, with you guys just to hang out, ask questions, talk to people. But, you know, I've heard like, I've heard like athletic trainers, like swapping information or, you know, advice on things I've sat, you know, I've hung around with different teams or when you guys would get, um, you know, maybe like, a other grad assistants from a different school or something, trying to get their experience with a certain sport that maybe they don't have at their school or they're getting loaned out for something. Um, you know, I hear conversations like, the full-time trainers that get these students from other places or with you guys, it's like quizzing you guys like, Hey, like in this situation, what if, like, if you have this, like, what do you do? Well, I'd probably do that. Have you ever thought about this, you know, and like offering up like side stuff to that. And so no, it's not just like, um, it's not just strength coach specific, but uh, you know, I was very uh, fortunate to be able to sit in the office with our head strength coach, be able to have constant communication with our assistant strength coach and with the other grad assistants who, you know, have a slightly different background in terms of their competition history, what their interests are. Um, you know, I've worked with people that have heavy, heavy basketball background or interest. I myself was big into softball, baseball. Um, that's what I grew up with. And then I've had other people that are very heavy into weightlifting, you know, even competing with themselves um, or for themselves and then bodybuilding as well. You know, other people have much more, um, interested in that. So it's just kind of a wide variety of ideas and backgrounds. Everyone gets to bounce things like, Oh, well, I, I do this program. I, I follow this person. I like to program this way. You know, I have my own way that I like to go about things and regressions and progressions. Um, and it's just all these ideas, you bounce stuff off, you ask questions and stuff and you start learning things. And that's, um, that was just kind of a big thing for me. It's like, well, crap, if I'm doing this, if I'm learning these things with my friends and with my bosses, why can't I do this with like athletic trainers and bounce things off you guys to like kind of get those ideas? Like you said, you know, different uh, variations to kind of serve those athletes pretty well. Um, So I was like, well, if it works in one, it's definitely got to work in the other, or at least I'm going to try. So. Absolutely. All right. This is, this is your favorite one. It's my favorite part. (laughs) So this is uh the action item. Sandra's all about action. We need mm-hmm. 
thing. What, something to take away from. Yes. So what do you want ATs to know about strength and conditioning specialists? That, mm, there's so, uh, <laughs> all right, I'm going to try and take the action item here. The, the, I would say, um, based off my personal experience, um, just we're in like working with that or ATs and like obviously having to introduce myself into them and come into a new atmosphere is, you know, I'm, I'm much more, I would say that like my experience is that athletic trainers kind of looked at me as like, Oh, he just like, he's just going to have them lift heavy and there's no like self-control. It's just like, it's all gas, no break. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I got, a, I got a pretty good break here. I'm not going to go all gas. Um, I would say the biggest thing is that we are, you know, we're, we're looking for help on some things just as much as you guys might be looking for help. And we're trying to make a team out of the two or out of the departments in here and become more cohesive in that nature. Um, strength coaches don't hate ATs. Uh, strength coaches aren't scary people to talk to just because we grunt and we yell and we uh, are assertive in this stuff. Um, we're quite calm on the, we're quite calm when you come and have a conversation with us. Um, I know from the strength coach side, the ATs are very highly respected. Um, I've heard conversations from people, you know, that say like, well, I don't think like my strength coach or my staff really respects my opinions and stuff. Um, just having conversations with people at conferences and meeting them and it's like, okay, well, I mean, that could be true, but you know, from, I think a general standpoint is that, you know, you guys are really responsible for getting athletes back into the weight room with us or helping get them back to where we'd like to get them to be able to work on things when it comes to their training programs. So you guys are definitely highly respected and, um, you know, always welcomed uh, when it comes to like coming to the weight room or coming at our offices and stuff and really trying to, you know, talk shop and kind of work on stuff with athletes. And I would say for for ATs, you know, we're very used to being advocates, whether it's for for the athlete or patients or even ourselves. That's always a common theme amongst athletic trainers. I think one of the biggest things that we can advocate for are strength and, strength and conditioning brethren because, mm -hmm. you know, you could be at a place and you're seeing all these injuries. It could be a good idea to advocate for a strength coach to be there to help lower that stuff. So I think looking out for each other, you know, we're used to advocating. This could be one thing to advocate for is for the strength conditioning profession. Absolutely. It's really welcomed, actually. Uh, <laughs> you know, especially like in, I mean, in the, the private schools and stuff, that's a different thing. But especially in the public schools, you want, you know, you got a lot of, there's, I mean, there's a lot of schools out there. And at high school athletics has become a much bigger deal than it has ever been. And when it comes to that, you know, it's, I think, I, I mean, I've always viewed it and I'm not just in a selfish way because, you know, wanting to have a, have a secure position and whatnot, but, um, I view it as, as the same as having an athletic trainer. It's a necessity. If you want, if you want to take it seriously, if you want to really look after your kids' health and their safety going forward, having a strength coach is just as necessary as having an athletic trainer on staff to work with athletes. You know, I'm pretty sure it's a requirement that you have somebody there for athletic events. Um, yeah. and you know, maybe not the athletic event that the strength coach has to be there. Obviously they most of the time are because they're involved with these kids lives, but, uh, definitely when it comes to these kids training and their safety, it's, you know, trying to reduce that injury risk, um, for these kids, especially when like, they don't know what they're doing when they're yeah. first starting off. Like that, I mean, they know bench and squat, but like if I had a nickel for every bad bench press or bad squat that I've ever seen in a gym, I would, I would be retired. I'd be doing this, uh, you know, from like the Bahamas right now, Randy. So. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's something that I think people take for granted, don't think about. And so, um, it's definitely a necessity. And, um, I think for them to work together is definitely, um, a necessity as well, because it's not just, you know, I hate the idea that people think that, you know, we look down on athletic trainers or athletic trainers think that we're just like meatheads. Um, and we just like, you know, we don't like know how to work with people or we don't know how to go around injuries and this and that. It's like, well, a good relationship fixes a lot of those, you know, those preconceived thoughts about everybody. So. Absolutely. One of my favorite parts of the interview was just being able to talk to Spencer about how clear communication and how intertwined athletic training and strength and conditioning can be. 
Yeah, and I really like how we touched upon the fact that not all athletic trainers or not all strength and conditioning coaches have worked with one another. And so it's really cool to see when, like, what does an actual successful relationship look like? And how do you create that? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I I probably mentioned, I think I mentioned it, you know, when we were talking to him, but like, if you're at a place that, you know, one of the biggest impacts as an athletic trainer, you know, we always look at like, okay, how can we reduce injury risk? Um, If we're seeing a lot of injuries, how can we treat those better? Um, I think one of the biggest things to advocate for is a strength and conditioning coach if you don't have one at your school. So if you guys have worked with a strength and conditioning coach, or if you have not worked with a strength and conditioning coach, head over to our Facebook group at facebook.com slash group slash AT Corner Podcast um, to join our AT community with other listeners of the show, with other athletic trainers, with our other clinicians. And then um, we post every week about different questions and different topics. So you guys can hear about how other people have worked with strength and conditioning or how strength and conditioning has worked with athletic training all that. And if you guys are new, we do every other episode as education or stories. This interview was an education. So next week, we're jumping back into our stories where we share stories and experiences from athletic trainers that you guys can learn from and hopefully relate to. Yes, absolutely. You got anything else, Randy? Nope, that was perfect. Thank you for helping us showcase athletic training behind the tape. Bye. Bye.